you know, a huge part of what producers do is, is, is about HR, effectively, about people management, about, you know, supporting people, making sure people feel comfortable, making sure that they've got, that they're in an environment where they can do good work, you know, that interpersonal uh, skills, if you like, I actually think go to the core of what it is to be a producer, because you are working with, you know, often, you know, very creative, talented artists are, are you know, they're very vulnerable and have insecurities and, you know, you need to create an environment where they feel comfortable and confident and, and do the work. My name's Kay Elliott, I work at Screen Skills and I'm Director of High End Television. Um, screen Skills, for those of you that don't know, we're the skills body for the screen industries, so we're here to support you to develop your career, to help people get in, but also to keep them moving forward. Um, and today's session is supported by the High End TV Skills Fund, so we're really grateful for that. And of course, to our fantastic session leads, uh, Hugh Warren, who is uh, about to go into production with Pulse TV and also Patrick Schweitzer, who works for Tall Stories as exec producer. So it'll be fantastic to hear them talk about the role of producer and all of their kind of own experiences within that and thoughts on the role. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Hugh and Patrick, who will take you through today's session. Hello, everyone. Now, I wonder if it's, it's good to start with our careers, Hugh, and how we started out. So do you want to give a little summary of where you began? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. People always ask, uh, how did you get to get to be a producer? And um, I always feel slightly awkward, when, particularly when at the beginning of their careers ask, because I, I never had a plan or a strategy. I kind of got there quite accidentally in a way. Um, I knew I wanted to work in TV production. I originally thought I wanted to work in documentaries. I thought that I was quite a sort of politicised young man and um, thought that that was a very uh, good way of communicating ideas and I ended up working in various uh, production companies in different roles really effectively coming up production I was a location manager I was a kind of uh, then went into production management and then into line producing and I never had a kind of game plan in a way I suppose and that would be my advice to anyone at that stage of their career is to kind of um, just get in and to find out more about the industry and how it works and get on set and see what interests you and really where, where your interests and talents lay so I, I, I kind of came up through I mean originally I, I guess Lady Henry's company actually Crucial Films uh, a company called Charles Play that Peter Tavern ran um, and then kind of moved in through BBC Productions. It's a long, I was freelance all my career. I did 18 months at Granada, I guess, but otherwise I've been freelance all my career. It's, it's a sort of totally freelance industry and kind of, um, we'll probably talk a bit more about that, Patrick. I, yeah. I mean, I think we've had quite, quite similar careers in that we've both been freelance. I also came up the production route, starting as a runner, ended up being an assistant location manager fairly quickly, location manager, line producer, production manager, first line producer, producer. I remember initially starting out thinking producing was something I wanted to do but not necessarily having a very clear idea about what the job was but seeing it as something that was more attached to story I guess and that's the, the story <clears throat> narrative was something that drew me to the industry in the first place so but, but I remember feeling um, and, and feeling very lucky to be guided by a few a few key figures in my career. Ruth Caleb said quite early on, just enjoy the journey because mm. she knew that having come through the production route as well, that, that each stage brings so much to your life and, and whether you're a runner or just starting out, the people that you meet and in that stage where you can just absorb everything that's going on, I, I still recall as one of the kind of fondest parts of the career where you're just amazed at the collaborative effort everyone's going through. And, and then every step of the way, I think, being freelance in the industry, it is something that you sort of have to motivate your own career progression because you don't necessarily have a corporation or a, a company that will, will always look after you. But, but just each job, thinking about why you take it, and, and I think the importance of feeling open that my, my first job was as a camera trainee and I had no interest in working in camera at all, but it really gave me an insight into what they go through. And I think having a sort of informed knowledge of each each role in the industry is really for me kind of helped and put the whole I, thing together. I think that's really true I mean that advice from Ruth is really 
good advice. Enjoy the journey. I mean, that's good advice in life, really. I think <laughs> certainly as I'm getting older. Um, yeah, and that, uh, you know, I would second that idea that really, to be a good producer, you need to really understand how production works at all levels. It's not just about uh, story. Story is obviously the most critical thing. And like you, I was kind of slightly in awe of that in a way. You know, when we were in production, scripts kind of arrive like manna from heaven. You don't really think about the process of getting to those scripts. Um, and I think, you know, there are generally, or, or historically, there have been two traditional ways to get into being a producer. You've either come up that script route as a script editor, or you've come up the production route as a production manager, line producer, as, as you and I did. Um, and I think for both sides, there are kind of areas that you're going to feel insecure about. You know, for a script editor who's used to being in a room with two or three people max, really, to suddenly be on the floor with the circus, 150 people and everybody looking to them to make a decision, that can be incredibly intimidating and they don't know much about production. So there's a big learning curve there. For you and I, a big learning curve was how scripts are developed, how you get to scripts, working closely with writers. Um, and I guess the best advice I had, I mean, I also had kind of mentors, I mean, Greg Bremen at Tiger Aspect, my first producing job was um, playing the field. I did the second series after being the line producer on the first series. Um, and both Greg and Ryan Ben, actually, who was running the scripts there, who was brilliant. I learned so much from her. But Greg said a very interesting thing to me right at the beginning when I talked about working with a writer like Kay Meller, who was a very experienced writer, of whom I to give notes, in a sense. And he said, you just have to trust your instinct. And really, that's the, the best advice you can give, in a sense, because everybody has a, a view on a script, however confident they feel in it. But, and that's the kind of, you have to trust your gut on that and, and either you'll get it or you won't. Um, I suppose the other thing, was the thing you slightly touched on at the end of that, was that it, the, the process is always a collaborative one. I think there's a sort of slight intimidation when people are looking at the role of a producer and thinking somehow that you're like the general out in the field kind of and, and you have to lead everything and make all the decisions and everybody is following you and it's really not like that you know it's a collaborative process from start to end you know you're collaborating with a group of execs with a company you're collaborating with a writer or a team of writers you're collaborating with directors you're collaborating with the DOP and the designer right the way through the process it's a collaborative process so it's not like you, you're on your own having to kind of make decisions in isolation. You're working with a, a team of people. Um, and I guess that, you know, the more I have produced, the more I've realized coming from production, I kind of always felt that the, the shoot was the really stressful time and that was a really important time. And that's when the magic happens in front of the camera. And to some extent that's true. That was another thing Greg kind of hammered into me. You have to be there, you know, if you don't get that moment on the floor, then you haven't got it in the cutting room. But the most important stage actually for me now is, is about prep and it's about putting the team together that will do that work. Because if you get that right and get the creative talent right and get the chemistry of those people right, the process is going to be so much smoother uh, and you'll get so much better material. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think just going back a bit to career progression, because I have a number of friends who I've come through the industry with who also are interested in producing. And I think there's often a conversation around which steps will get you there faster. And I, I remember a time, I think you were probably one of the early producers to move from line producing to producing because there's a perception that the nuts and bolts of line producing and the awareness of a budget feels more removed than the creative elements of producing than it actually is. And looking back on my career, I now can see even the sort of early roles as location manager, that the guiding that you do of the production even whether you're choosing locations or you're across the background artists, it's all so um, much a part of that larger effort to try and get the thing right. And, and every bit of contribution to the sort of greater collaborative creative effort is really important. And I think that, I suppose that may have been the message Ruth was trying to impart was just enjoy every step for what you're delivering to the production. Because, because as you head towards producing, I found that that's, that sort of pooling together of talent feels like one of the, the roles of the job that I wasn't necessarily as aware um, how important it was, that you are, mm. you are trying to listen to everybody and trying to create space for that creative freedom to flourish. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think 
you know, you don't know what you know in a sense that that process of working through those roles, particularly if you're on the floor, whether that's as a location manager, production manager, or indeed increasingly first AD, you know, there's a, a quite a set path now where first ADs are becoming producers, uh, which is quite interesting because, you know, on one level, I, you feel they don't, they don't have the script knowledge and they don't have the budget knowledge, if you like, but actually they're right at the heart of the production all the time. They're with the director, they're with the actors, you know, and, and, and you kind of just absorb stuff in a way. And that was the thing I think that's really important. That's why I always say to people, the most important thing is to just keep working in a sense and keep gaining experience for two reasons. One, because you're learning without really consciously being aware of that, but you're absorbing all that knowledge. You're also making contacts. And that's really important that you're kind of experiencing other people and how they work and you're forming relationships with those people. And they will be things that will help you, you know, as you progress through your career, hopefully. Um, no, it's, it's, I think that's really important to touch on as well as that sort of wider pool of, of how contacts continue to, to keep very relevant in your career because, because it's, it, it, as you crew up, the industry runs on very short um, run-up times for production and you can't always keep your favourite teams together. So as you progress through your career, I, I remember feeling it was quite devastating initially when you're sort of stepping off a, a shoot thinking I may never see these people, they probably will never come together in this this grouping again and it's been a really joyful experience there are a few key jobs that I remember Blackpool was one of them where it was a musical drama I was location managing and the kind of cohesive collaborative feel of cast and crew was just incredible I think having singing and dancing on set no one could be miserable because it just puts you in a better mood and it was away from London we we're in Blackpool for sort of certain stints and everyone was very sociable so but but those sort of um, experiences I think keep you going with every job because some of the jobs are tougher and you end up in a, in a difficult shoot for no one's fault. It's just through circumstances and through um, little hiccups happening. Filming is all about trying to tackle the unexpected. So, yeah, I mean, every production is different. I mean, you never stop learning. I mean, even, you know, I've produced a lot of TV now, but uh, it's always different, you know, and, and it's always different people and actually, I think that's a very good note in the sense, yes, people get out of sync. There's a temptation to want to work with particularly key creatives, you know, <clears throat> directors, designers, DOPs and so on. You, you feel like you want to, you've created a good team and you want to keep working in that team. Actually, it's really healthy to keep, it's the kind of grit in the oyster. You keep kind of bringing different people into that mix and that kind of keeps everyone on their toes in a way and the chemistry is always a bit different. And that's great fun as well. It's really exciting. You know, I think it's a real... That's one of the joys of the job for me, in a sense, is that, that 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 chemistry is always different, and there's always different personalities with different foibles and different strengths and weaknesses, uh, and and talent. You know, one of the it is a, a a privilege in a way to spend our lives working with very talented, idiosyncratic people. You know, both sides of the camera. You know, I certainly. I mean, for me also, when I started producing, one of the things I found quite tricky was the casting process because I would sit, you know, with the director in casting sessions and, you know, great actors would come in who I knew and have this sort of in awe of and I would think, oh, what, who am I to kind of ask them to read to me and, and to make a judgment about them? But that is, you know, the same for everybody. You know, that's the joy of it, that you have or you are as a producer, you're a kind of broker of talent in a way. Um, and that that is, you know, putting having the privilege of getting that talent together and then getting the chemistry right in that team, you know, thinking who will work best with whom in, in, in terms of, you know, the designer, the, the DOP, the costume designer, all those kind of things. That, that if you get that right, that's really exciting and it should be really fun. You know, it is a, a fun journey. Yeah, you're quite right, I think. I think the most rewarding jobs that I've done and, and I know when we've discussed it, are when the, the team feel in harmony together and as though they're having a really good time because I think better work comes from people feeling able to deliver in a really um, creatively nurturing environment where they feel happy every day going to work. I've done jobs where it's been harder getting up going to work because the general atmosphere has, has for one reason or another not necessarily gelled. So I think for me what was exciting about line producing and producing was just pulling those teams together and feeling as though you are aware of people's natures and who will fit together on one job particularly well and perhaps on other jobs it's good to be mindful of, of who perhaps doesn't rub up 
don't rub up. So I, I, I think that's really true. I think there are two things there. What, what, one is that it's an entirely freelance world we work in. And one of the great joys of that is once people have signed up to a production, everybody across the production from, you know, from the runner to the director and whatever the kind of department they're in, it's in their interest that that show is as good as it possibly can be. So everybody is pulling in the same direction. Everybody is supporting everyone else. If people have a bad day, people support them because it's, it's in everyone's interest that it's good. Whereas my only experience for you know 18 months of my life when I worked in house at Granada, although I had a great experience there, um, I found it a bit baffling at first, particularly with the script editors. I couldn't understand why people weren't sharing ideas and why they weren't working collaboratively. And it took a long time for the penny to drop that, of course, they're not collaborating, they're competing. You know, they're looking for the next job and for the next production. They're not thinking about that one production. So one of the great benefits, I think, of being a, a freelancer and certainly as a producer is that everybody around you, there's no politics in a sense, they're all working to make that show the best it can be. And I also, I agree with you, I think that, you know, you, people do better work when they feel nurtured, uh, you know, considered, cared for. I'm, I'm not a believer, there is a school of thought, and it's kind of more historic, I suppose, there certainly was a school of thought that felt that, you know, productions had to be tough and they had to be really grim and, you know, people had to be fighting all the time and explosive and somehow something more creative would come out of all that pain. And I don't believe that. And that's certainly not been my experience. Most of my painful experiences, particularly with, you know, difficult individuals, I suppose, either side of the camera, uh, have not, they've not been creatively uh, beneficial. You know, I don't buy into that you've got to go through pain for it to be good. You know, I think you can create an environment where everybody feels valued and respected and they're going to give better, you know, commitment and, and do yeah. better work. Yeah. I think that's really relevant as well, especially since the, the Me Too movement. And well, I think there's always been an awareness of behavioural traits on, on set. And I think um, more recently things have changed, the landscape's changed. So it, it feels as though producers and line producers, execs are all duty bound to just ensure that, that nothing on set is happening that is slightly adrift from how things should be. And I think that, that feels best monitored by just keeping in touch with the crew. I remember producing does take so many different shapes and forms depending on if it's a, a multi-episodic series with different directors on each block or a single authored piece. So those feel as though they take slightly different efforts as a producer to, to make sure you're around at the key moments because obviously multi-episodic, I'm not sure who in the audience has got which level of experience, but multi-episodic means that you need to always be prepping with the, the incoming director to make sure that they're continuing the sort of authored voice of the, the first block. Um, Whereas on other shows, you as a producer can end up looking down the monitor every day and being on set with the team if it's just one director and there's no other prep to do. But yeah. I think those, those sort of um, slight shifts can often, would you say, just give a different weighting to how the line producer will be more proactive on set day to day and then be feeding information back and forth about any issues. I think it's key yeah. to really know what's happening on set every day, pretty much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. The role of a producer is very different on different kinds of shows, you know. That, and it's, honestly, it's different every show because it depends on the particular uh, makeup of the individuals. Certainly, if you're working with one director on a single drama, I mean, in a way, I, I kind of long for those moments but, but, but because then you're only ever at one stage of production at one time, you're alongside the director all the time, you're creatively involved all the time. But yes, if you're doing multi-episodic, you may be working with four or five different directors. You'll be developing a set of scripts, you'll be in prep on another, you'll be shooting another, you'll be in post on another. You simply can't be at, at, at every stage all the time because there's just too much going on. So you have to have people you can delegate to and you know I can't stress that enough the importance of delegating I think uh, you know micromanaging is a it's a route to a nervous breakdown in a way you have to have people around you you trust and, and know you know when to step away and, and keep an eye on the bigger picture in a way I think it's a producer on those big shows and certainly all you know the shows I've done recently where you have you know where they are multi-episodic where you have different companies involved, a whole different team of execs, your role is very different. Um, and indeed, quite often on those shows, in the last few shows I've done, um, you know, on, on Gangs of London and on Hannah uh, and on Hot Sun, I, I would have 
uh, a block producer who, who will take over a block because you can't keep on top of everything. So the, the role is very different. Um, and that's part of the fun. You know, your role on a small production is, is much more intimate and hands-on. Your role on a bigger production is much more distant in a way, inevitably, uh, but also exciting because you're working with a bigger team of people. You're working very often at higher stakes. They're much higher budget and you've got American producers involved. You're working, you know, in different time zones um, and, and you're having to manage all, all those uh, things, which is, you know, different from doing a single or a two-part. Well, I did, I think that's changed. You know, I don't know if Patrick, we should just sort of segue straight into this in a way that the, the kind of the nature of high-end TV production now has really changed in this country. You know, it used to be when you and I were doing early productions, you had one broadcaster and generally that was either the BBC or ITV. You had one exec producer who you had a close relationship with. You maybe had an exec producer in the independent company if you were doing it through an, an indie, but it was a very small team of people. Whereas now we're working on shows that have massive budgets and that come from very different sources so you'll certainly have you know Gangs of London was was Sky and HBO or in fact it's going to be Sky and AMC uh, you're working with teams of executives from those companies particularly with the Americans because they have a very structured uh, a, a very business-like uh, organization I suppose and they expect things in very particular schedule you're kind of doing report back meetings you're kind of the, the the liaison person between all those execs and taking that to the floor to the directors and to the to the actors who you know can quite often have a big role themselves sometimes your lead actor will be an exec producer as well and they're creatively involved in it so it's kind of steering a path through all those people uh, is, a, is a very different process for being you know having one exec on a three-parter yeah i was going to ask you about that Change because I imagine your early career it was it was pretty much along the lines my my sort of start in the industry it felt as though a lot of producers were quite often staff or they had a sort of development producer role they'd then get the project away it would be commissioned and they would run it um, and pretty much run most of the creatives they'd make all the creative decisions so there would pretty be an exec attached and I think your early career started in that that sort of yes it, it did start that way I mean I guess after playing the field I did at home with the Braithwaite with Sally Wainwright and um, when I look back on that I find it extraordinary actually you know Robin Shepard who was the director on the, on the first book and myself you know made decisions I mean about casting particularly I remember one casting I'm not going to say who <laughs> both Sally and John Whiston who was head of Yorkshire at the time really felt they didn't agree with and, and Robin and I just said, well, we, we don't agree. And, we, and, and the casting went our way. That would be kind of unthinkable now. <laughs> and we were left to pretty much get on with it. Um, and, and that was, you know, in some ways, if I'm honest, it, it was great fun, but it was slightly almost amateurish in some ways. I think the, the environment changed pretty quickly. And I think the structure that you've just outlined with producers in-house developing and then producing and then, you know, having much greater autonomy really hasn't existed for a long time in mean, most of my career there, you know producers are pretty much freelance now it's very you have development producers in house I think that's also the thing people have to realize that developing a project normally takes years you know that, that people don't commission things immediately and ideas I mean you know, people work with writers for a long time then there's availability issues very often a project that is, goes into production has been in development for years, sometimes over 10 years, you know, it yeah. takes a long time. So generally what happens now is that within a, an independent production company, they will have a development team who will be working on those projects. When they finally get a green light and they may have you know, one script and maybe some story arc, storyline through, but that's it, then they get a producer in to kind of manage the show and, and to take ownership of it. Um, so I do, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that that whole thing of, of of the producer being having that autonomy, I don't think really exists anywhere. I mean, maybe in some feature films that era it does now, but I guess some showrunners still hold that authority. But they're generally writers, you know. Showrunner, yeah. that's the difference. You know, I think that's the big difference from the, the American system. I mean, the, the brutal truth is a, a producer in the way you and I worked in our early careers doesn't exist in the American system. You know, yeah. they're, in, in, they're, and they're being, writers often. Yeah, they're writers. It, 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 they have the writer's room. You know, we have different histories, I suppose. You know, our industry, 
essentially came out of theatre in a way and, and had the author's voice and it was all about the playwright and the writer, you know, whether that was, you know, Dennis Potter or Polyakov or whoever, you know, that, that was our history. That was how, whereas in America, it, it, it's about product in a sense, it's an entertainment industry. And so they've always been much more of an industry. You know, I mean, when you and I started out calling what we did an industry, it was slightly yeah. overstating it. <clears throat> um, so, you know, there is a different history. And so uh, as, um, thanks to the tax break largely, you know, we, we have a lot more co-productions and a lot more American, I mean, the last four shows I've done have all had American uh, companies involved. Uh, that different way of working has come to bear on, on our way of working yeah um and a showrunner in that american model is always a writer you know they're the key creative they're not the producer you know those kind of the, the sort of producer you were alluding to earlier that i think really were a bit of a fantasy in both of our heads of how people were i don't that that doesn't exist now you know the creative force and, and when you know certainly on the shows i've done i don't know you know whether that's with neil cross or sally wainwright or jeb mercurio whoever you're working alongside a creative writer who has the, the, the sort of overarching drive of that and, and your job is to work collaboratively with them and, and enable them to realize their aspirations for that project yeah. you know, and, and to help them achieve what initially might seem very difficult to achieve you know on, on a practical production level. I think I think that's really relevant to talk about as well because that transition to far more people being involved at the exact level with increased budgets the a big effort that needs to to sort of form part of the day-to-day -day work is is the nuanced acknowledgement that somebody may have come up with the embryonic idea to begin with so they feel very attached to it um so you'll have a writer potentially an executive producer or somebody who's developed the project who feel as though they've been the creators from the very sort of first conversation about what this could be which is always fascinating because you know that there are it's a brave step to then release that project to start to be made and obviously with the people who are the broadcasters who are paying for it they feel as though they need to make sure that it's shaped in the way that they're expecting the project to sit on their channel so it that for me i find incredibly rewarding but it does it has changed there can be a lot of people to to keep up to date with what's going on about you know and scripts are analyzed hugely now and, and every sort of nuance in the script needs to be examined that it's going to hit the mark and the fact that we need to listen to everyone as producers and everyone's voice is valid and every opinion is important to hear i think and then yeah but but also your role is somewhat to protect that original voice as well because i think that that is important there is an embryonic idea and ideas develop and you know there's no uh, the, the ownership of that idea does become a sort of multifaceted you know there are many parents of, of, of a successful show but you do often have a voice in there and to me, it's it's really helpful to have that key voice, you know, whether that's Sally Wainwright or Neil Cross or whoever, that, that somebody who you can really go back to, or, or Gareth Evans on, on Gangs, you know, you go back to the core of what that, that initial concept was and does that fit in, you know, that, that you, because there are so many disparate voices with different agendas often, with different ideas. But your your role is to kind of, work find a way through all those and, and, and create a consensus so that by the time you get onto the floor with the directors and the actors you have a you, you as the producer have an understanding of the consensus of opinion that everybody from the different broadcasters different funders from the initial writer or creator whatever that that you can safeguard all that on on the floor and it is you know and it's not that's why particularly with directors you know i think that, that, that they come in slightly later normally and uh, you have to work with them and make sure that, that that they respect that process i suppose um because it's not you know i don't think that auteurish way of working that you know i don't know maybe comes out of a european film model uh really works in in, in certainly not in multi-episodic tv um you know that, that if and I do think that, you know, I think that we've talked a lot about the collaborative process for, for creativity. And I think that is at core, the real core of, of good high-end TV production, certainly. And that if somebody wants to be an author, wants to be an artist, you know, then they can get a canvas and paint a picture in a way, you know, that there are big, these things are, you know, big budgets. They're four million plus an hour. So you're looking at, you know, tens of millions of pounds for a production. That's like running a small company, you know, you could, nobody has the right to say, 
I'm going to do whatever I want with that. You know, we all have a yeah. responsibility to the people who are putting up that money ultimately. Yeah, the increased risk, you're right. But, and, and the other thing I guess we haven't touched on is the, the role with the director, because after all of the development process has happened and we're in pre-production, everything is pretty much handed to the director to deliver on the day. So yeah. um, for the shoot to feel um, supported enough. So I think that's been quite fascinating, especially the shift in the North American model where directors don't necessarily stay on board a project for the edit. In this country, we I think perhaps, again, it goes back to the theatre. Um, yeah. Directors' voices in British television tend to sort of stay on board until delivery of the project in some shape or form, whereas I think the US model once the show's up and running is that they may do three days in the edit and then step yeah. off for the... That is a very different process. And, and to be honest, I've never really worked fully on that American model. I had a little side experience in fact with a German company, Tandem, a show called Spotless, um, where they, they kind of set themselves up in that American studio model. And I found that slightly weird. I mean, we, we do come from a culture where directors do see the, it, it through creatively, through post-production. And generally, you know, particularly where you have a lead director who's setting the tone for a show, uh, I, I see you, you choose that person really carefully, you've invested in that person, you believe in them. So our job in a sense is to create the best environment for them to do their best work. You know, you create an environment where they can be you know, their talent can shine in a way. That's why you've employed them. Um, and, and to me, it feels slightly perverse to cut them out of the post process. Um, but no, that's not to say when you come to that cut, of course, their voice isn't, and that's what I mean about there, there isn't a room for an auteur in a way. They don't have the final cut, you know, they don't have the final say. Indeed, we don't, you know, ultimately it's, it's, it's the execs, you know, it's, that's never a, that you reach that consensus through a collaborative process. It's not like somebody dictates that, uh, but it, everybody has to accept the fact that they haven't, it's not their money, they haven't put it up and they, they don't have that very final say in a sense. And all we're doing as, and in all those roles is we're trying to be the viewer and to consider what they will find the easiest, most rewarding story on screen. I mean, it's a fascinating process when you're in the edit and all these voices come out, but you often need that. You need different people's perspective on a, a cut just to oh, keep it sure and, and that i mean the post-production process I, I find fascinating i mean it, you know there are three stages to making it in any production to making a film or a tv show whatever you know you, you, there's there's the development of prep and, and developing that script there's the shoot and the production and then there's the edit and they're completely different processes it's almost like you start afresh each time and the, the important thing for me about the post-production process is the value of an objective voice an objective viewer ultimately that you know but if you've been through that you know year of your life and it's all, always pretty intense you know going through a production process you, you you're not objective in, in in the cutting room you need and that's why for me it's really important that the execs stay out of the cutting room so you know you the director works you work with the director and then you invite the execs in hopefully with a more objective distant perspective who can see things you know separate from uh, the, the agony of the truth, as it were, you know. So, and there's a process in that. Now, and I do think that it's really important that I feel this both with scripts and with the, the, the edit, that you only ever get the experience of the viewer in those stages once. You know, the very first time you read a script is the most important time you'll ever read it because that's the impact it will have. Uh, so it's really important you put aside time to read that uninterrupted and in a focused way. And similarly, the first time you go into the cutting room to look at the cut of, of an episode or a film is the only time you will experience it fresh in the way that the viewer does. So they're really important parts of the process. And once you've done that once, you don't have that objectivity anymore. You need someone else to keep coming in. So, you know, you have layers of execs, so you always have a, a fresh eye on it in a way, which is why I, I get really cross when execs want to come in too early or want to, you know, watch all the assemblies or something. It's like, no, no, you've got to keep away because I need that objectivity. Yeah. And also the fact that, that we're on a timeline at that point. It's not as though you have weeks to sort of step away from it, have another look. It's all yeah. very rapid. All those viewings need to be phased so that exactly as you said, you get fresh eyes on the project. Because we all carry residual sort of knowledge when we're watching an episode that we need to make sure it's actually clearly told in the, the story. and. I think if you're too close to it, you start getting a little bit blind to how well it's working. So I think that structure is really well sort of 
in place I think and 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 every project's different again in that post-production for me yeah. post-production was one of the most exciting changes in my career when I came to producing because it's a side of the industry you're not exposed to when you're when you come the production route it, it can be the most rewarding and, and it is and sometimes you are it's like being in, in development again you are reshaping that episode completely and you know if, if something because very often you know, you'll find things that work really well on the page you thought were brilliant just don't work actually and, and you realize then that you've got to rewrite that bit of it effectively and 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 shoot a little pickup or reshoot the scene or you know cut out a whole subplot you know all those yeah. things so it's a very post is an extraordinarily creative process and great fun and, and you know in a much more relaxed environment you're in a nice cutting room in Soho with runners bringing you nice coffees and food you know you're in a comfortable environment it feels a bit of the payback doesn't it if the shoot's been miserable through the winter and cold yeah. or, no that's yeah. absolutely true it is payback but it can be tough as well you know it can be scary when you when you get into that cutting room and you realize that episode just doesn't work and, yeah. and you know they, they, and then you fix it and also those decisions, I think, that are made in the cutting room. I really remember, especially location managing, shooting certain sequences that might have taken weeks to set up and days to film, and suddenly <laughs> they form a tiny part of what ends up being broadcast, or they disappear altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those decisions in the cutting room need to be brutal, because if it's not working, it's just not going to land. I think if, you, if you come up the production room, particularly you and I as a line producer, I had to learn that really fast. It's that thing of, you know, killing your babies in a sense. You know, you know that you spent a fortune on that, particular sequence it was really hard to pull off you know everyone took months of preparation you get the cutting room it doesn't work no you can't put a caption up saying you know that the, this, this would have been better if yeah exactly if it's not working you've just got to get rid of it that's it yeah no no it's been i think i mean i'm continuing to learn i, I as i'm sure you are with the, the industry evolves it seems to change with every project with different pressures obviously at yeah. present we're facing filming in a pandemic so it's yeah. I mean, that, that, that's absolutely true. And that's always exciting. You know, I mean, I think both in terms of the structure, we've talked a bit about that, about how international productions and having teams of execs rather than one exec has changed our role, but also technology changes, you know, I mean, it, but partly because of COVID, uh, you know, we, on gangs too, gangs on too, we're, we're looking into uh, Unreal Engine, a kind of, uh, uh, it's almost like doing visual effects before you shoot, you know, and shooting an environment with, with huge LED screens uh, to create a world that enable you to shoot in a studio what you would have had to do on location. And that, that's that been really interesting for me looking into that because that technology, I think, will change the way we work completely, you know, so, uh, in production. And, and, and is doing that in film production. Certainly, yeah, it lends itself to science fiction films. I mean, you know, Mandalorian was shot in that way. That there are, but that will, I think, affect all of us in the same way that, the access to visual effects and, and visual effects coming down in price for TV producers made a huge difference. You, know, you can go to a location where in the past you would say, oh, it's great, but it doesn't work because of that building or whatever. You can say, well, we'll paint that out. You know, we'll just stick a green screen there and fill it in, or you know, we'll get rid of those, that whatever's in the skyline that we don't like. You know, you yeah. that. Whereas, but, do you remember kind of 10 years ago or 15, I remember my early production, you'd see a, an artist there with a glass piece of glass painting the skyline two days before you were due to film it because that's the only way you could kind of capture a different skyline above. I, I, I do remember it's more than 10 years ago though, Patrick. <laughs> I get blurry with timelines. Maybe that's yeah. I've been doing it for too long, possibly yeah. 40 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but no, the, the advances that I think in CGI and visual effects, I remember having a conversation on set even when I was location managing thinking, how far away are we from this losing relevance? Because if we can create a world with CGI that, that feels real, why would we spend so much money? Because it's, location filming is incredibly expensive. It's not the most efficient model. And hugely difficult taking that circus, particularly in central London as gangs is, you know, and even just the basics of finding unit bases and all those things, which is going to be really compounded by COVID. But, but, but of course, and that technology, there's a real crossover going on now with gaming yeah, and that the technology that they use. In a sense, and, and I think there is a, that's quite exciting. There's a, there's a merging of those different cultures, if you like, and, and those technologies that can be, incredibly liberating and then will enable us to tell stories and go places you know we're, we're, in gangs we're talking about in season two going various different places in the globe we won't physically go there we, we you know we had the uh, gangs one even when we did that in post with green screen you know we the, the story went very globally you know went to nigeria it was in ireland it went to uh, you know morocco to kurdistan whatever you know the, those 
places. We didn't physically go there. You know, you, you, you don't uh, need to. And, and, and that, that's hugely uh, exciting, actually. That means that we can tell stories that we wouldn't have been able to tell 10 years ago or five yeah. years ago. Two years. Very true. The one thing that hasn't happened yet is computers can't generate stories quite yet, and they can't give notes. <laughs> That's not the way that would be. No, and also, as a producer, you know, they 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 they're not very good at people management. You know, a huge part of what producers do is 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 about HR, effectively, about people management, about you know supporting people, making sure people feel comfortable, making sure that they've got that they're in an environment where they can do good work. You know, that interpersonal. Uh, skills if you like i actually think over the core of what it is to be a producer because you are working with you know often you know very creative talented artists are are you know they're very vulnerable and have insecurities and you know you need to create an environment where they feel comfortable and confident and, and do the work in the same way as trying to persuade a crew that we've got to do an hour over time when it's you know three in the morning and pissing with rain yeah, you have to be able to manage people in a way, and like people. And I think you're right that the percentage of effort that goes into producing a job that relies on people skills, keeping things up as harmonious as they can be, is a lot larger than I'd realised. The creative element is incredibly enjoyable, and it's constantly there. But it probably only takes about twenty percent of the sort of daily workload because yeah. gathering people together to discuss these creative issues and all of the the extra awareness that you need of what stage you're at in production, where things are, are heading, really do take a lot of the time and just, and just managing people's dynamics, making sure everyone's feeling included so that it keeps things running smoothly. Yeah, uh, that, that's right. And, and the other aspect of that is that for a lot of the time, once you're in production, it's certainly on set you may actually feel that you're not actually doing but a lot in a way in, in that you you need to be there because at some point the decision's got to be made and they can be quite scary when you know 150 people turn and look at you for that decision in that moment and you've got you know half an hour left before you've got a wrap um but you know I, I have that feeling you know when I'm standing in a muddy field at seven o'clock in the morning in the middle of nowhere I think what am I doing here you know why do I need to be here but you know that that's the nature of the process that everybody has to be there to kind of make those decisions at the right moment and as a producer on the floor ultimately it comes back to you you've got to call it obviously you're talking and getting advice from people and different you know it's a consensus but ultimately you have to call it um yeah that, that there are a lot of times when it's not necessarily about creativity although of course you do have to call it then you know when you the actors as indeed happens so it kind of happened to me on Hannah in quite a major way with you know Joel Kinnaman and Murray and us decided in in the finale scene of the episode that while we were shooting it that they did, couldn't quite work it out and they didn't grit and they wanted to reshoot it well we closed down a whole street in Budapest we dressed it as Berlin you know it's a, a massive expensive thing I, I had to run to set talk to the director talk to them and actually decide and we did pull it and we did take it off so you know you are some of those practical decisions do have a creative element you know actually now we're working on this scene it doesn't quite work and the actors can't get it so let's stand it down and do it when they can and we set that up in fact in the back lot of the studio separately um so yeah there, that, that, that there is a it, I, I understand what you're saying Patrick. That's many of those decisions are not about creative decisions but generally they're they're intertwined in a sense they're the, the, the kind of the doubt that might happen on, on what you're going to do in that moment does have a creative uh, aspect because it's about what you're going to shoot to get into the into the edit yeah i think you're right in that, that there are certain days where so some days my brain hurts because it's been worked so hard other days i i finish the day thinking i've done nothing i've been on the yeah. phone all day. <laughs> i've been speaking to everyone all day but i've actually done nothing everyone else delivers the job in some yeah. ways you're you're sort of but, but, but that doing nothing and talking to everybody actually is enabling them to do their job to some extent. I, think. I guess. But I know what you mean. Definitely. I have those days too. Yeah. Now, I think Kay... Kay is coming back in, isn't she? Is that... Yes, I am. I've got some questions, some great questions for you. But, but first, obviously, a huge thank you to both of you. I think that was fantastic and I'm sure um, everyone got a lot from that. So I'm going to get through as many questions as I can. So do you feel that the role um, a producer will change further in the future with more streamer shooting in the UK? 
I think it will continue to evolve, yeah, I mean, inevitably, and, and yes, it will. And I think, as I said before, that the biggest change in that is, is that is a loss of autonomy in a way. And, and, and me personally, when that started to happen, I found that quite difficult. I felt that was kind of uh, emasculating, if I can use that word, um, and that you were kind of losing your role. And, and I felt kind of cross about that, that I didn't... Have, I felt like I no longer had sign off on things particularly creatively, but actually I've learned to, you know, I've come to understand that it's actually very empowering that you are able to consult with many different people who have got very different experience to you and sometimes quite extraordinary experience and very uh, extraordinary creative talent. You know, that's a real privilege to be able to work with those people and then make that decision collaboratively, but that, that, that will go on. And I think that's why I say if people think, being a producer is about total ownership and being able to dictate everything. Those days are long gone. You know, it is a collaborative process. You are working for many different bosses, often from different, you know, uh, streamers, finances, whatever. Uh, and that that is not undermining. Actually, it's quite liberating. And and ultimately, that they're putting up the money. You know, when I did Hannah with Amazon, that was a, a, a big learning curve for me. And there was a lot of a very different structure and 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 quite uh, micromanaging text in some ways that at times I found tricky, but actually it meant that the show was, was better than it would have been, definitely. I think, I think you're right. I think it, me, it, it relies on producers staying adaptable around who needs to have what information communicated. So the Americans investing money over here feels as though there will be potentially two sorts of shows running in parallel where the American shows, they have slightly bigger teams in their studio system where everyone in that team wants to monitor what's happening on the show so you may find there are 20 people on a conference call all from america and all you're doing is repeating what you've actually been living and breathing that week because they want to know what's happened they want to the sort of full report on where the production's at mm -hmm. whereas on a british show that that those sort of conversations happen more organically because everyone's on the same timeline yeah you know, there's big conference calls so I think it's exciting. I think it's amazing that people want to invest in, in our industry here and, and to, yeah. it, it will continue to grow, which is great. And we need to stay adaptable to fit the new requirements. Great. Um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, what you might expect from a block producer and indeed the level of responsibility a block producer has on the day? Well, certainly when I've, I've worked with block producers, generally, I mean, my own experience has been there have been people with a production background. Uh, actually, not always, thinking about it. Well, um, it was a script editor on the gang, Steve Searle. Uh, the, 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 it's, they really uh, take responsibility on the floor, ultimately. Uh, it sounds like I'm just repeating the same thing again and again, but it's a collaborative process, so you work with that person. Generally, uh, for me, it's hugely... Uh, liberating, you know, uh, uh, to hand over to a, a block producer. I personally try and give them as much ownership of that block as I can. Uh, you know, uh, certainly on Hannah, when I had a, a really good block producer in, and, and, you know, on this next season where I'm already working with a, a block producer, I'll probably have two block producers. It, it, it enables you to step back in a way. So the, the responsibilities are, being on the floor it enables me to be away from the floor much more so I'll just be looking at rushes rather than having to be there so they need to be able to have good relations with the, particularly the director of that block and that's a key relationship they, and, and I have to be confident that the director trusts that producer and then you know with the DOP the designer and the, importantly the cast you know they have to have an independent relationship with the cast uh, and, and speak with them and if there's any thing that they're not sure about it's just about you know picking up the phone ultimately you know just we, we, i will be talking to that uh block producer you're never alone in that in, in the same way as i'm never alone in that i can if, if there's a difficult decision and something that's not working i will talk to the execs about it as well um but really it's it's the day-to-day -day management on the floor i've i've worked in a way where i also would have the those block producers having the first input in the cutting room so they would continue working with the director in the cutting room and I would probably come in with the company execs at that stage so it changes my role there as well um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good way for people to get into you know uh, producing overall. Yeah. I think the biggest challenge as a block producer as well is that for me I would want a block producer to pretty much be staring down the monitor with the director's sort of 
process, but not being a checker. So to be able to form a relationship with that director that is inclusive, where the director feels that's a huge support for them and not a kind of threat of a spy checking that everything's... Because I think in the moment of filming, there's so many things that can easily get lost, in, either in the script, landing a particular moment, or there's, it's just an incredibly busy day with a lot of activity for the director to, to stay across. So the best relationship of a block producer and director is as a real ally so that they are just checking that everything's landing. And for me, it's the having done producing jobs where I've been on set every day looking down the monitor, which are incredibly rewarding. It's almost as though you have to, to sort of hand that over to somebody and gift it to them to say, can you just be that, that support? Because, and it's so not coming from a place of wanting to be control freaky and obsessive. It's just that as soon as it hits the edit and it's not right, it's too late. So we'd rather have more options of a take that doesn't necessarily feel as though it's working so that you just know that you can hit the edit and create the best story. So there, yeah. and there are many other responsibilities that go with being a block producer besides that. But for me, that feels quite a key um, ability just to, to get in with the director and become good working buddies. Thank you. So in your careers, what show have you learned the most from as a producer um, and, and why? What did that teach you? Wow. Patrick, do you want to go first on that? <laughs> <laughs> I would say I it was my first producing job, Whitechapel. I was very lucky and I got to know Sally Woodward Gentle who gave me that break and she threw me in there. I was, I think I probably do best when I am facing an incredible challenge and I don't know what I'm doing and I just have to learn really quickly. But it's, Hugh touched on it, it's about finding that creative voice where I didn't really have the chance to find it. I was suddenly in a writer's room uh, with the writers having to deliver my thoughts on the script and I was just expected to. And I think for a lot of us, when we're starting out in our career of, of wanting to contribute, at the moment that you're suddenly doing it, I think was the most rewarding, thinking, oh, actually, no, I, I have got an opinion, and it's based on instinct. And every script I'd read to that point, I'd had an opinion on, but I was never paid or asked to contribute. So I think for me, that was just a, a great um, marker for the next stage of thinking okay now I'm in this world now I know what I'm meant to do when I read a script a bit more and I'm expected to to sort of comment so I guess that for me was I, I, I'm going to say the same thing actually but I think you're right it, it is inevitably the first and for me it was playing the field as I say with having Greg Bremen and, and Ryan Ben particularly uh, to learn from and, and, and yeah that's incredibly empowering realizing that uh, you can do it in a sense and that there's no great mystery to it uh, and then I suppose I would say that my next production at Home with the Braithwaite is partly working with Sally Wainwright who's so brilliant of course uh, that I learned that was where I kind of felt it was the first thing I produced it was the first season of it and that felt very empowering working with Sally uh, closely and with Robin Shepherd to create that world and the tone of that world. Uh, I probably learned the most doing that. But as we said before, you learn on every show. Every show is different and, and that's part of the fun of it. It's never ever the same. Okay, great. And um, so, the role of the producer's assistant, how common is it for you to have that? And do you feel that there's a preferred background of somebody who may want to move into that role? What kind of tips would you give for somebody who feels that that's the routine? And then finally, is, in addition to that question, mm -hmm. is, is that producer's assistant with you throughout the whole of the production? Like, would they get to learn the whole process? Okay, that's an interesting question because uh, for me, the simple answer is I, I've, I've never had a producer's assistant. Um, you know, you have a production team, you have a, you know, your production, you know, your line producer, your production manager, your coordinator, your production secretary, the runners, you, know, you have a whole team of people around you who are supporting you. I, I have, that there is, people are now working on these bigger shows, you, people do have director's assistants and producer's assistants. Um, and I did start going to London with a producer's assistant, and, I, and maybe it's just because I, I'm not familiar, I haven't got enough experience of working in that way to understand how to, Delegate. There are times now, and actually, it's a discussion I'm having with my own line producers now whether I should have a producer's assistant. Um, uh, I, I suppose, in, uh, I, in terms of what experience those people should have, uh, it, it would just be a, a willingness to learn, in a sense that they, 
to work with you. I mean, I don't know, Patrick, did you, have you had a producer? I've, I've never had a, a producer's assistant either, but I, I know from witnessing it on some larger scale films, a director can have an assistant and producers can have assistants. I think it's very varied what people are looking for. Sometimes it's, it's doing the mundane day-to-day -day things they just don't have the headspace to do. And it's could... managing the diary and those kind of things, but it's a tricky role because certainly I've seen it, I might work with various uh, you know, bigger productions where you have had director's assistants and sometimes those roles can be pretty menial. You know, the director will be calling up from their hotel room saying there's no shampoo in the suite. You know, that, that is... That, uh, it's literally you know, life yeah. and things. But I'd say the better ones and better experiences people have had are when, you know, some producers will give an assistant access to all their emails so you're privy to every single conversation that's going on. And I think for a, an assistant in that sort of role, it's incredibly informative because you're tracking the progress of conversations and what they mean. Obviously you need to be very mindful that, the, that it's information that can't be shared. So I think it varies. I, I'd say a lot of it is because a, a producer or director just feels that the day-to-day -day job um, that they need to be doing is so large that it's sometimes perhaps less rewarding, from, especially from people who I've spoken to who've done that director's assistant or producer's assistant role where they have just been stuck doing the, the sort of day-to-day -day jobs that don't necessarily give them that much access to industry discussions. So, but I think it's, it's so individual. I think if you're up for a producer's assistant job, it's really a very good thing to dig into all of that if you get a meeting. A huge, huge thank you to Patrick and to you. Um, it's been a brilliant session. I hope you've all uh, really got a lot out of it. I certainly have. So thank you so much and hopefully we'll see you again at our next session.